Over the course of making documentaries and TV shows on metal, I've had the chance to meet a lot of really smart and talented musicians. But without question, one of the smartest is John Lord from Deep Purple. When it comes to articulating the connection between metal and other genres of music like jazz and classical, John is the best. He's basically the headmaster of metal. And given he's no longer with us, uh, we wanted to share these clips with you. Slate is up. John Lord, take one. Well, I thought it'd be nice to start by talking about classical music, something you, you know a lot about and have been involved in for many, many years. And I th I'd like to start by talking uh, about Bach, uh, particularly, I guess, starting with what do you think Bach's contribution uh, has been, first of all, in terms of the music he created. Okay, so this is a four-week program, is it? <laughs> yeah, you know, We've got a few composers to go through, so that's a uh, big question. give me your... I guess, ultimately, what I'm interested in is how what he has done is, is contributed to your playing, and um, what, if any, is, is there a lineage between Bach and, say, hard rock music, for example? Uh, well, I, I think what, what Bach... Um, perhaps pr proved more than anything else is the, that although music has a mathematical quality, of course it's a, it's a system, you know, uh, mm. by which we produce, reproduce sound and, 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 and uh, but, but he proved that, it, that, that those mathematics could also be emotional mm. and that they could, uh, that you could forget the mathematics and, and, and discover the emotion. Um, and this giant intellect of his uh, was at the service not of science or, or, or of a system or of a scheme but at the service of the human heart and emotion and, and so on mm -hmm. so uh, that's a lesson for any musician right there you know mm -hmm. I mean uh, you can practice and practice and practice uh, on the guitar the keyboards or whatever until you're blue in the face and fleet of finger uh, but if you don't uh, play from the heart then uh, you might as well Stand in the, out in the street and whistle tunelessly. It'll have the same effect. And and how did Bach influence you? And how did you think what Bach did seep into the music of of Deep Purple? It, well, it, it, it it's a thing called a sequence. It's a um, it's a, a system of of chords with rising or falling uh, sequences, uh, which is repeated uh, either in the same key or in the next key up or the next mm -hmm. key down or whatever. That sort of effect, which uh, which I think it, it's something for the for the listener to to hang on to, uh, and and if you like, in a way that's something also for a, for a, a performing musician to to hold on to a, a guy who's, uh, who's writing rock music or whatever it may be to hold on to the the uh, the basic premise that something attractive repeated mm. uh, is. Uh, I'm not saying, you know that. Uh, Bach invented the hit chorus, you know, the zing in the middle of a song. But, but you know, that, that the same kind of rule applies. Mm. I learnt about him uh, as a young pianist and uh, uh, discovered the, uh, the, the rightness of it, how it felt under your fingers to be going where, where he was taking mm. me. Um, and I guess other musicians have have followed that same path yeah. and discovered the same thing that, that I discovered. I mean, I don't, I don't sort of quote him mm. laboriously at every available opportunity, uh, but just as, as a nascent performing musician, as a, as a young kid just learning my chops, it was interesting to see what JSB's chops were to mm -hmm. see if they had any relevance to what I was doing. Yeah. The main reason why I'm asking about these composers is because I think classical music and hard rock music tend to be used in separate conversations, but I think what, what you've done and what Deep Purple did is brought them together in, in some way. So, in a general sense, how do you think the sensibility of classical music uh, became part of Deep Purple's music? How can I put this? If it became part of uh, uh, Purple in any way whatsoever, it was because of a fan, of a fan-based thing. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I was a fan of classical music. I mean, still am. It's my, it's 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 meat and drink to me. You know, as as, as much as anything else. Mm. And I think it was only a, a question of, 
you know, saying, what can we use here? How can I get this emotion across, you know? Mm. Uh, as I say, the further we progressed down the line, the less we used it. But going back to talking about sequences, you know, mm. and, 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 and the, the, like a sequence that Bach might have used, Highway Star and Burn are two good examples, I think, of Richie and myself using, um, sequ uh, you know, almost Baroque mm -hmm. style sequences to support a, a keyboard or an organ so or a guitar solo. Mm -hmm. um, so I think maybe it was always in the, the back of the mind. But you know, like, if I'm ever going to be an evangelist, it's going to be on this one point, you know, that it's all music. Uh, it, it's, I'm not a great fan of, of labels, and although you've got obvious labels like, of course, classical music for want of a better label, is immensely different to rock music by its very nature. You know, I mean, it'd be a dull world if it wasn't different. But the larger umbrella that I would prefer to, 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 to use is it that it's all music, yeah. and you dip in where you want. It's, it's Forrest Gump's box of chocolates, you know, I mean, it, it, you, you can go wherever you want. Yeah. And to me, uh, where I'm sitting in my life, pretty much every chocolate I've ever taken out of that box has tasted good, so um, I'm uh, pretty all right with all that. <laughs> uh, I want to shift towards uh, talking about jazz. You've been talking about improvisation, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm curious to know where the inspiration for you came from to create improvisational pieces w with Deep Purple and, and create that sense of interplay. Who were the main influences on you in terms of improvisation? Well, well I, I think the, the first influence on you as an, as an improviser has to be yourself. You have to have the, uh, the, the, the courage uh, to uh, go off the page. Mm -hmm. To go off the page, to go to go away from the written uh, page, and, and and to just trust uh, this sort of um, playful imagination, that, that this other part of your brain that's able to make things up for you as you go along. Uh, it, it, that's a great uh, moment in your life to discover that. But of course, uh, and discovering as I did in in my teens that I could sit at the piano and improvise. Um, although then it was it was in based in the the way I was learning, which was a classical way. Mm -hmm. So when I have you know after college, when I ended up in a in my first sort of blues band, I think you know, it was more jazzy blues. Um, and being asked to improvise, John, you take these two choruses here that you know, and uh, you go oh. <laughs> bang, you know, and you're off and running. So then you start to listen to great improvisers, and, and I had my heroes at the time, you know. Dave Brubick was a great hero. Mm. Uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, on the keyboards, Oscar Peterson, but then players like Parker and, and, and Miles Davis and so on, and you, uh, listen to the way they looked at improvisation in two massively different ways. Mm -hmm. And you start to see that you, you know, if you, if you keep your technique up, which is your servant, as I've said before, then you can ask your hands to go anywhere you particularly suddenly feel they ought to go. And, and one of the marvels of improvisation, I find, is that sometimes you actually look down at your hand and say, well, you know, it's almost like an, another part of your brain goes, why did it go there, you know? Mm. And, it, and you realize you've just done something good. So um, I don't think you can learn to improvise. You can, you can help yourself be better at it mm -hmm. by, by, by keeping your technique up. But I, I don't think if you're, a natural, if you're not a natural improviser, uh, that maybe people would disagree with me, but I, I, I can't see how you can learn to improvise. You have to feel to improvise. Mm -hmm. You have to be, um, you have to trust yourself. Mm -hmm. And some musicians just, especially of course, classically trained, uh, uh, conservatoire trained musicians, find it almost impossible to conceive going off, off the page. Mm. Um, shifting to rock music itself, when did you become aware of, of rock and roll? What was the first, what was the spark for you? Uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, I think. Um, Elvis maybe, but to me Elvis wasn't rock and roll. Elvis was this kind of deep, dark, strange voice that I wasn't quite sure whether I liked or not. Uh, 
but then I heard Jerry Lee doing a whole, a whole lot of shaking going on, and my world flipped. Mm. Uh, that was an absolutely seminal day when I first heard that. What was he doing that excited you? It was raw. It was untrained. I could tell, because by this time I was a reasonably well-trained pianist, that what he was doing on the piano was nothing to do with what I had been taught to do. And by God, I wanted to sound like that. But I couldn't make the piano in the front room uh, sound like Jerry Lee's piano on, on that recording, because I didn't know at the time there were, you know, echo chambers and all that kind of thing. But uh, there, there was a kind of an, uh, an animal edge to it that, that I found tremendously exciting. And then also uh, Little Richard for, for the same reasons. Mm. I was talking with Ian about Little Richard as oh, well. And just you did you would cover L Lucille, I know. What, 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 what about Little Richard was, was inspiring for you? Well, it, it, on the one hand, it took the simplest of, of, of uh, forms. Uh, and, th and this astounding voice, this, 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 this raw emotion in, in, in the voice. Uh, and the feeling, even before I knew that he was actually talking about something a little bit rude, you know, like that. I'm sure that tutti frutti means something else, but I didn't know what it meant, you know, but uh, I'm still not absolutely sure, but, um, um, you, you know, and, and um, Long Tall Sally, you know, I pictured this woman, you know, I remember I was a teenager, you know, so I, I had dreams. Um, no, I think there, there was a kind of a raw animal, untrammeled, un textured, untutored uh, yeah. feel to it all. And that to me, as a very textured, tutored young man who'd you know, been poring over Beethoven, Bach and, and the like for years, uh, this was massively exciting. Yeah. And the, you see, what, what, but what happened to me, and I have to, to say this, and which is why you know, God granted me great luck here, is that when I heard that and it spanned my head around, I didn't lose the love of the stuff that I'd been working on yeah. for all these years. I just conflated the two and it all became music to me. And, yeah. and that's really, I suppose, uh, identified my life for me ever since. It's, it's, it's defined it. And was that raw emotion something that you w wanted to be part of the, the purple sound as well? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it was something that I'd been fighting uh, to get into my playing from the first time I became a professional musician with mm. the Artwoods, mm. um, you know, and, and started casting around to find ways to to identify myself differently from everybody else that I heard, so that I could just say, you know, like like Gillen says in one of his lyrics, you know, we we danced and sang and stood on a mountain top. Well, that's where you want to, and you, and that's where you yell from mm. when you're a young musician. Mm. You stand on the mountain top and say, you know, this is me.